Good day, viewers. We welcome you to our series, Importance of Communication Within the Christian Family. However, today we are going to concentrate on keeping records of wrongs. Now to take our, heart, our minds back, let us just look at briefly what biblical communication is. Biblical communication includes communicating verbally, honestly, regularly, and purposefully. Ephesians 4, 25 to 29 is here informative. This is to be done early, clearly, and lovingly. Now the very last thing I said, early, clearly, and lovingly, is usually sometimes the cause of misunderstanding in the family. When we do not communicate early, we do not communicate clearly, and no matter how the situation is, if we do not communicate lovingly, it brings disagreements. And it is these disagreements that sometimes lead to keeping records of wrongs. Now, I want to look at this keeping records of wrongs from a particular Bible passage, 1 Corinthians 13, which is called the love chapter. And verse 4 to 7 is informative. I will read the text for us so that it will help us in our discussion. Love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself. It is not puffed up. Does not behave rudely. Does not seek its own. Is not provoked. Thinks no evil. Does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. Bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. Now to attempt to unpack this text, love suffers long. Simply means that we have patience with imperfect people. And that takes me to Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is committed to we Christians who are imperfect. Love does not envy. By this, it means that since love is non-possessive, it is non-competitive, we are not in comp competition, it actually wants other people to get ahead. Hence, love does not parade itself. Love has itself effacing equality. Quality. It is not ostentatious. It is not puffed up. Treating others arrogantly, arrogantly. Love does not behave rudely, but displays good manners and courtesy. Love does not seek its own. I repeat that. Love does not seek its own. Insisting on its own rights and demanding precedence. Rather, love is unselfish. Love is not provoked. It is not irritable, it is not touchy, it is not rough or hostile, but love is graceful under pressure. Love thinks no evil. It does not keep an account of wrongs done to it. I repeat that. It does not keep an account of wrongs done to it. Instead, it erases all resentments, all resentment. But hear this. Love does not rejoice in iniquity. Finding satisfaction in the shortcomings of others and spreading evil report. Rather, love rejoices in the truth and by this it aggressively advertises the good in somebody. Love bears all things, defending and holding other people up. Now, the last part of that text is love believes all things, hopes all things, and endures all things. What does that mean? By love believing all things, it means love thinks always about the best in others. It credits them with good intentions. It is never suspicious. Love hope all things is never giving up on people, but affirming their future. Yes, he has a problem today. Tomorrow he will be better. Love endures all things.
persevering and remaining loyal to the end. Now, if we can see what this text is tell telling us about is that there is no place for keeping records of wrongs within the family. No place. No place. If we call ourselves Christians, if by chance we keep records, we find ourselves keeping records of wrong, there, there, there must be problems. And I will, I will suggest some eight issues here. Some eight issues here. The very first thing is arrogance. Thinking the best of myself. It is okay with me. I am the best. And so, I, I, and, 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 so and so other people can fail, I cannot fail. Arrogance. This arrogance can maybe even be triumphalism. Triumphalism in the sense that we say we think that we are winners, the best. The children of God, we are on top. We are the, we are the head, not the tail. Is that right? So nothing ever, nothing ever will do that will go, will go wrong. It is wrong. The second thing about keeping records of wrongs is that we are playing God. It is God alone that keeps records of wrongs and rights. And my Bible tells me that those records are not kept here on the temporal plane. They are kept in the eternal plane. And it, on the day of judgment that this wrongs will be open. So when we start keeping records of wrong, we are playing God. Three, keeping records of wrong, it can be a complex. It can be a complex. Sometimes we always praise ourselves what is called victim mentality. Eh, it is, I'm the person that is being hurt. I'm the person that is being hurt. Nobody, no, 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 no uh, I do not hurt anybody. I'm the person that is being hurt. It's a victim mentality. Number four, ignorance. Keeping records of wrong is ignorance. Ignorance of the most important thing to a Christian. We do not yet understand what happened at Golgotha. We do not yet understand what Christ did on the cross. On the cross, Christ died for the sins of every human being. Every human being. And if I understand that on the cross my own sins were forgiven, I will not hold somebody else about their sin. Number five, if you are somebody that keeps records of wrong, I beg, I beg you to check yourself. Perhaps, just perhaps, you are not born again. Perhaps you are not born again. What is being born again? Being born again is now living a new life in Christ Jesus. And how do you get into that? How do you get into that? my sins have been forgiven. It is because my sins have been forgiven and I've appropriated the finished work on the cross. So what am I? I am just but a forgiving sinner. I am the product of forgiveness. Number six. People who keep records of wrong, I tell you, reject God's mercy. By that attitude, it shows that you have rejected God's mercy. They, 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 it's very simple. In our Lord's prayer, we say, forgive us as we forgive those who... So if I don't forgive you, I'm saying, keep my sins. I have rejected the mercy of God. I have rejected the grace of God. <coughs> Number seven. Perhaps you are a microscope. There was one preacher that was preaching, precisely the Bishop of Usasa. He said, the problem with Christians is that we are a microscope. We are always trying to find out the sins of others. And he says that even the micro microscope is even better in the lab. They use it to discover the problem so that they will solve. Mm -hmm. We will use, we look for the problems in order to maybe feel better, feel good, maybe to, to minimize our sins while maximizing others. And perhaps, and perhaps, we have the gift of criticism. Some people's gift is criticism. You don't see anything wrong. You don't see anything right with anybody. You are always looking for fault in others. And so you revel in it when you get it. Particularly when it's, it's done to you. Hallelujah. You have achieved. But for the Christian, and especially in the Christian family, there's no place for keeping of records of wrong. Somebody says things like this, and I like this for, I want us to remember that. He says, when you return good for good, that is human behavior. When you return evil for evil, that is animal behavior. When you re return evil for good, that is demonic behavior. And when you return good for evil, that is Christian behavior. 
Romans 12, 17 to 21 is here informative. He says, do not repay evil for evil. And as long as it depends on you, live at peace with all men. In fact, if your enemy is hungry, if he's thirsty, it goes on to say, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil by good. And one thing we tend to forget, which I want us to note, is that all sins that are committed are ultimately against God. All sins are ultimately against God. Who is ever willing to forgive? All sins. A life without forgiveness results in a vicious cycle of resentment. But one important thing most of the time we don't remember is that there is just one person, just one person, one person on earth whose character and conduct you can control or vote for, and that is you. So you will not expect anybody to do exactly what you want them to do. If they fail, you shouldn't be surprised. In fact, you should even bother yourself if you fail yourself. Because it is only your own character that you can vouch for. And generally, uh, uh, when, when, we teach, when we teach young people in the marriage class, when we teach them, when we are counseling them, there are some, some things, some 10 character principles you want to give them. I'm not going to that. But I just mentioned two here. Uh, the, I would call the first one is the character principle. The character principle in marriage is concentrating on being the right person. You concentrating on being the right person. If you concentrate on being the right person, I tell you it will be well with you in, the, in, in, in your family. Sometimes we always want the other person to be the right person. But it does not work. And then the commitment principle, that's the second thing, commitment principle. Commitment principle is imitating Christ Jesus. Imitating Christ Jesus, who is committed to imperfect people. If sinless Christ is committed to me, imperfect me, then I will not be committed to another sinner. Christ is sinless. He's committed to us. We are imperfect. Remember he says of his church, he says, I know my own. Nothing will ever snatch them from my hand. And the church has constant, continually, constantly failed Christ, but Christ has never left his church. Sometimes we see the church is marching on, the church, the gates of hell will not prevail. Is it our faithfulness, is it our holiness that, make the gate, that, that, that will not make the gates of hell prevail? No, it's because Christ is committed to his church. So commitment, when we are committed, the father committed to the uh, uh, mother, the parents committed to the children, the, com the children committed to, we are committed to make our family an example. In any case, what is even marriage? What is it supposed to be? Marriage is a ministry to each other and a mission to the world. Ministry to ourselves within the family so that the truth of God and the grace of God is seen in our family. And it is a mission to the world in that the world will see what it means to be in relationship with Christ Jesus. And so sometimes we fail. But there's something. There's just something. And I like this very well. Somebody will say, in others, search for virtues. In yourself, search for vices. We normally do it the other way around. When you search for virtues in others, to start with every human being is made in the image of God. Look out for the good in a person. And when you look at the, even you search in people for virtues, you will, you, this will help you to overcome some of your problems about them. It will make you to understand and realize that there's something good in every person. But if in yourself, if you search for things, you will find, you realize that you yourself, you are a fallen sinner. You are a fallen sinner. And that you make mistakes yourself. Sometimes does it not happen to you that you, you wonder why you cannot even forgive yourself. Sometimes you blame yourself. Sometimes you smart yourself. If you can wrong yourself sometimes, is it surprising that somebody else can wrong you? Yet we keep these records of wrong. The Christian life begins with forgiveness. It is when we were forgiven our sins that we became Christians. The Christian life continues in forgiveness. At every point in time, daily we fail God. But God has not left us. And it's this forgiveness that we are forgiving sinners that will make us to become children of God. And hereafter, we shall enjoy what Christ 
has prepared for us upstairs. So the Christian can always afford to forgive because he himself is a product of forgiveness. A Christian can never ever afford not to forgive. Luther King Jr. will say, forgiveness is not an occasional act. It is a permanent attitude. Sometimes we joke with some of my friends, uh, clergy, and uh, the, the, some people in the marriage class, in the Bible class, we joke with each other, we say, when somebody says she has done something wrong, say, I'm not happy. What you have done is wrong. But I've forgiven you your sin, including the sins you commit in future. <laughs> That's the issue. And what is, what is this? We're not, we're not, we're not, we're not, we're not, we're not uh, uh, selling indulgence. No. What we are doing is that what can help you to forgive somebody if you prepare to forgive them even before they commit the offense? I found that useful in marriage. I am telling you, I have purposed and I declared right from the day I married that there is no offense that my wife will commit I will not forgive her, and I mean it. So by the time she offends me, the pain is less. In fact, the healing has started because I have purposed to forgive before the offense is committed. So you find it. Augustine is, uh, Augustine is one, of, uh, one of the, uh, the, the church fathers. Nobody, nobody, nobody who reads theology, uh, everybody must have to go through Augustine. Augustine says, if you are suffering from a bad man's injustice, forgive him, lest there be two bad men. He's a bad man. If you don't forgive, you know there are now two bad men. Is that right? There are now two bad men. That is you and him. And the problem about, the problem normally we, we, we face is that sometimes, sometimes people wrong us out of weakness. Sometimes people wrong us out of ignorance. Sometimes people wrong us. Not because they propose to wrong us. But the painful part of it is that our reaction, we propose to do it. We resolve to remain angry. We resolve to remain to, 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 to refuse to forgive. And you find that we are even worse off. So the, the issue is if God forgives us, we must forgive others. If God forgives us, we must forgive others. If God continually forgives us, we must forgive others. Because the danger here is that if God is forgiving, and I'm not forgiving, then I am saying that I'm a higher tribunal than God. Am I not setting myself above God? God is forgiving me as I cannot forgive. So God's court is the lower court. I am the supreme court. I am putting myself over and above God. You see, uh, 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 forgiveness is a very funny thing. One very funny thing. It warms the heart. It warms the heart and it cools the stink. And I tell you, I tell you, my, 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 my brothers and sisters here present, that friendship in itself, friendship of any kind, of any sort, flourishes at the fountain of forgiveness. Flourishes at the fountain of forgiveness. But unfortunately, what do we find? I know of cases of people who had problems in their marriage, and that problem started at the wedding reception. And for 23 years, there was still that problem. So most of the time, most of the time, we assume, we assume positions that God has not placed us. We are the saints 
other people are sinners. It is unfortunate. It is very unfortunate. Yet, our faith is a faith that derives from God forgiving us our sins. Take the case of Jesus Christ. I like the case of Jesus Christ. Colossians will tell you that. Colossians 1, 15 to 20. I like that it is, it, it is believed to be one of the Christological songs of the early church. I like that uh, text, that very portion. But one particular place I like about that text is everything was created in this world for Christ and through Christ. Created for Christ and through Christ. Everything in this world. Yet, Jesus Christ, Philippians 2.5 will tell you that, Jesus Christ said, though being God, he did not consider that something to be grasped. He humbled himself. And what happened? He became man. The creator becoming creature. And to do what? To now save man from himself. It is man that fell. It is man that offended God. It is man that sinned. Yet God condescended to come and die for man. Now the cre cre creator becoming creature. Not just that. Not just that. Christ came as a man to die for man. He came as a Jew. And was betrayed by the Jew. But get, get this one here. This is even the most important part. Of all the professions in this world, Jesus Christ came as a carpenter. And because of his omniscience, anytime he was in the workshop helping his father, he was relieving his crucifixion. And it was the carpenters that crucified him. Crucified by carpenters. That's the only trait he ever learned. Yet on the cross, he said what? Father, forgive them for they know not what they are doing. Maybe you say Christ is God and so uh, it is easier for him to do it. But let's go, let's go to Stephen. Let's go to Stephen. The first Christian matter. Stephen was stoned. Stoned to death. Not because of what he did. But because of what he believed. And at the point of death, what does he say? He said, God, forgive them. At the point of death, he said, God, forgive them. So what's that offense that somebody will commit against me that I will not forgive them? Especially. Again, Jesus Christ said, love your neighbor as yourself. That's a very good one. Love your neighbor as yourself. But let me interpret it for you this way. Who is your closest neighbor? Your spouse. Your, the closest neighbor to you is your spouse. If your husband or your wife is, the close, is your closest neighbor, then they are entitled to the dearest love. And if you love people, if you love people, what you do, you will be readily and willingly forgive them that which they have done against you. And most problems in families today is this unforgiving spirit. We hold on to what somebody had done. Do you remember you offended me 10, 10, 10 years ago? <clears throat> That's what you did last time. Somebody has committed, maybe, maybe your wife or your husband fails to do something now. Instead of concentrating on what has happened now, uh -huh, that is what happened last time. The last time, one month ago you did this, one month ago you did this, three weeks ago you did this, two days ago you did this, and so we pile records and records and records of wrong. They are not good for the system. Psychologically, they are not good. Emotionally, they are not good. And I like, and I like First Peter chapter three verse seven. It says, "You should treat your wives. You know, treat them. Be considerate to them as the weaker, so that nothing will hinder your prayers." Which means that if we are not living at peace with each other, the family, our prayers are but a waste of time. That's why concerted prayer is very important. Let's go back to the Bible again. The Bible says, when two or three are gathered in my name, I am there with them. Yes. And whatever, the Bible says, whatever they bind on earth is, whatever 
The loose on earth is loose in heaven. Now, where do you find two or three people permanently in worship? It is in marriage. Permanently. When we go to church, we go for congregational, maybe two, three hours we are gone. When we come for prayer meetings, two, three, one hour we are gone. But marriage is a relationship consecrated unto God. So this means that a permanent union, a permanent worship relationship. That is the only place you find people permanently in relationship with God. Permanently together in the name of God. So we, they are a very powerful people. And that is why the devil, the devil attacks marriages seriously. And we allow some little, little, like keeping records of wrong. Last week he did this, this week he did this, this week he did this, and there, and there, and there we are gone. The Lord will help us. Amen. The Lord will make us understand that keeping records of these wrongs is not in our interest. The good Lord will keep us. Amen. Praise ye the Lord. Praise ye the Lord. Praise ye the Lord. Do we keep records of wrongs? No. Are we sure? Uh -huh. Thank God for us. At this juncture, I will invite my brothers and sisters here, maybe to contribute, ask questions, and if there are any gray areas, you help us enlighten them. Yeah. Thank you so much, sir. I must really appreciate you. But in terms of forgiving, I also believe in forgiving. It's a good thing, actually. But one thing I believe is, you know, in a situation whereby a lady was raped, maybe the mother or parent, fine, you can, you can forgive such person, but you can never forget. Because some stuff like that will keep ringing to your ears, as in you will keep remembering and it bothers you a lot. Does that mean that person is here to forgive such person or what? Because she can never forget. She can forgive, but I don't think she can forget. Does that mean she's here to forgive? That is a very good contribution. Rape is one of the worst crimes that can ever be committed to a woman. While it has its physical aspect, the physical pain, there's the emotional pain and the psychological aspect of it. It's a very difficult thing. It goes off the side. To some extent, sometimes people are even, are even required to go into therapy to heal them. I agree with you. In such a case, it is very, very difficult. But again, our Lord Jesus Christ says, my grace is sufficient for you. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. On your own, you may not be able to do it. But when we surrender all that we are, all that we can, our wants, our pains, to Jesus Christ. He has promised and he never fails. It's not easy. It's not easy. People have, people have, uh, let me even give you, let me even give you some example. There are people who have seen their whole family wiped out, killed by even people they know. All these kind of problems going up now. And they, 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 the thing is, they have turned onto the Lord and he has done it. It's not easy. One thing, one thing for the victim, what I will always advise the victim to do is to cast their burden on the Lord Jesus Christ and he will do it because there is no situation in this world that those who put their trust in Christ depend on him and yield all their problems to him that the solution has not come you might not forget yeah, sometimes it may come and so on and so forth the important is not that you come it comes sometimes as you remember the heart might not be there with time God heals the wounds the wounds are definitely healed I believe so. I believe that um, this subject is very vital um, in times like this. Um, I want to ask, in a situation where perhaps one had lived a promiscuous life, you know, and then um, as a result of that, um, he had some things, perhaps like a lady who had children um, out of wedlock, or perhaps contacted um, a deadly disease, you know. Um, at the end of the day, she might have forgiven herself but you know, when, as time goes on, when she sees um, some things that keep pointing her back, you know, she just keeps telling herself, perhaps I'm the cause of this. I would have been somewhere if not for what I did. You know, um, it is okay that she has forgiven herself, you know, but um, is it still okay that she keeps telling herself, um, 
I, 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 I did bad. Just keep reminding herself, look, I, I did bad. Perhaps I wouldn't have been here if not for what I did. Something like that. Yeah. Two things. I, there are two things I get there. First of all, I want to warn us and tell us adultery is one of the sins that always visits somebody even when he forgives, them, he forgives, he forgives himself. It's one of the worst sins. That's why, for example, we, 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 we advise young people not to indulge in sexual acts before getting married. Because, uh, biblically speaking, sex is a wedding gift that God gives to the couple, and he does not want it opened early. Uh, we're all experienced per persons here. I'm very sure if you are going to be honest with yourself, you remember the first time you had sex. You remember whom you had sex with. You remember that. So that is a problem. So adultery is a very serious thing that continues to visit you and visit you and visit you. That's one. Number two, if you had been promiscuous and you contracted a disease, let's say, for example, HIV and AIDS. Let's go back to the Bible again. HIV and AIDS can only kill the body. Are we there? Not the soul. You, have now, you now have forgiveness. Forgiveness unto life. You, you have to always remind yourself that it does not matter what happened. Thirdly, if you find it difficult to forgive yourself, you ask God to forgive you for not forgiving yourself. Because perhaps you don't understand what Christ has done for you on the cross. You have to appreciate, you have to appreciate that there is no sin that is too big that cannot be forgiven. The efficacy of the blood of Christ is for all sins. And then fourthly, it is the weapon of the devil. Guilt is the weapon of the devil. The devil will always want to remind you so that guilt, a guilt reading mind does not think positively. And if Jesus Christ, on the cross, Jesus Christ saved me from the penalty of sin. So I can never, I can never, I can never be punished for those sins. I don't know why I should be guilty from it. Today, Christ is saving me. I am being saved from the power of sin. And one day I shall be saved from the presence of sin. So yes, those things can be saved. But remember that your sin, the penalty has been paid for at Golgotha. And today, Christ is helping you fight the power of sins. One day, you'll be safe from the presence of sin. So there's no room for guilt. So guilt is a weapon of the devil. He reminds you of just your negatives. That is why Paul will categorically say, take your thoughts captive. Take, it's, no, it's normal that you think about those things. But Paul will say, take your thoughts captive so that you don't allow them to control you. May bless in Jesus' name. Amen. Yes. So talking about um, forgiveness, there are some uh, sins being made in the past or mistakes being made in the past. And it happens to be very, very difficult to believe that you've been forgiven. Sins like tattoo on you. Because anytime you see that... Um, that's on you. You remember your past. You remember, you always think, because the Bible condemns it already, you always think, ah, can I be forgiven? That might um, stop you from entering into the kingdom of God. So I want to ask, can that should be easily forgiven? Because it's nothing that easy to forget, even if it's forgiven, even if um, we'll be forgiven about, and about that. Secondly, I would like to ask, um, I lost my dad about two months ago, and the, before he died in the hospital, I was there with my mom. We were together with him there. Then my, mom, my dad's elder brother will come to the hospital, tell my mom, you want to, you're the one planning to kill him, you're the one doing this, doing this. My dad had a heart problem. The man always come and uh, complicates the problem. Because any time he says that, my mom cry, my dad will cry. I see that man to be um, the second devil. That was what I concluded. Like, seriously. So then, my dad will call me because my dad knows, uh, knows the kind of person I am. 
I always wish to confront uh, the man, but my dad would talk to me, not to attend to things like that. I should be focused on things that are important. So after I lost my dad, my prayer point throughout that period was for God to handle that man to his satisfaction. That was my prayer. After I buried my dad, three days after I buried my dad, stroke caught up with that man. Yeah. Now I want to ask, is it a sin I, I committed? Because I, I always find, I always pity the man anytime I see the man. But I ask God if it's a sin, he should forgive me. But I want to ask, is that a sin? Thank you very much. Well, if, uh, if you will ask me, the very first thing, I, my first, first response to tattoo is, I will go back to Jesus. You see, I always have solution to problems in Jesus Christ. When Jesus Christ was crucified, he was buried. After three days, he rose from the dead. Eh? Were the marks still in his hand? Hello? Yeah. The signs were still in his hand. Yes. Even after he had finished the work of uh, this thing. I'm talking of signs now positively. Are we there? That the signs of Jesus Christ were still there. Was he still crucified? Hello? Had he risen from the dead? Yes. Had he completed the work of salvation? Yes. So conversely, I'll take it at the negative side. The important is not even the tattoo that you have done. You have come to a realization uh, you have been forgiven. God's forgiveness is not conditional. Are we, are we there? You see, when you are forgiven a sin, the consequence of that sin can still follow you. Let me give you an example. If you, if you are supposed to write your GCE in the year 2010, and you played a rough, rough life, you did not write it in 2010, you wrote your GCE in 2013, your classmate who rose at 2010 will always be ahead of you. The GC will reach 2010, your own will reach 2013. Yes, yes. But in life, you might even be better than them if you change your life. But they will not change the certificates. So the matter is not the tattoo. Then about your uncle. The first thing I have to tell you about, uh, about your uncle is that, you see, sometimes God, God uh, reduces the, our task. He simplifies our task. <coughs> The Bible says, go into the world and make disciples of all nations. And God brought, brought mission field to you right into the house. Right into the house. Right into the house. You look at those people whom you think as your enemies as mission fields. Those are opportunities to witness. You witness by your life, by your thought, by your actions, so that they will see in you Christ Jesus. That's why I have, a, I have a problem with imprecatory prayers. Imprecatory prayers are those prayers that you say, let somebody die. The Bible says, the Bible, when, you're, when your enemy is hungry, you should feed him. And the Bible says, I should go into the world to make disciples of all nations. That man is your mission field. And you see that because you prayed that prayer, you allowed your bitterness to overrule, you know, to take control of your emotions at that time. This man, this man had a stroke. Maybe that stroke has nothing to do with your prayers. And now you are, you are having, you are wondering, maybe it's because I did this, maybe because I did this. In some cases, we should always stick to scripture. Scripture calls us to peace. And the thing is, in any case, there's nothing anybody can do to me without God allowing it. Remember Job. Even the devil, God said, okay, you can touch him, but to this limit. And so sometimes, when we leave all our problems, when we take all our problems to God, it will save us some of these problems. I want you, the, 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 but the good part, what I want to tell you that is very, very positive about your case is that, that you are feeling bad eh, is a positive sign. It's even a positive sign. You see, you are very different from him. You are feeling guilty because you think you have affected him, your prayers, uh, your prayers affected him negatively. It's a good sign. And which, which means that, which means that the mind of God is still in you. Mm? So release yourself. Just take that case. Because say, God, if I, Lord, forgive me. And I'm telling you, go on. God will give you the peace that you require.
I want to make comment concerning this claim of right. You see, most of the problem that is going on in families today, even in the Christian home, is claiming of right. And you make mention of love does not claim right, even if it is your right. But for the fact that you have love concerning that person, you neglect your right just to see that you work together. But most of the family does not understand that. There was a case of a man of God. Of course, I call him man of God because he's a pastor. This man got a problem with his wife. We tried to settle them personally. I, I spoke to him, I spoke to his wife. They all understood what we said. But the issue is that it's my right. He should be the one to start you know, addressing me. I can't go and address her. I am the husband. I own the family. I own the house. She should come. Despite the fact he was the one that wronged her, but because he was claiming that he was a husband, so he don't see reasons to, ap to approach her as, as in begging her to forgive him. So if Christians might look at it in our feet, claiming of rights should be, should be out of our mind. It should be one of the things we should be silenting in our family because if we should keep on saying this is my right and claiming right, at the end of the day, the family my broke. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, you're, 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 I, I, I take to your point seriously. I agree with you. Somebody says that the problem with us eh, is always we are always fighting for our rights, not struggling for righteousness. And the, another example is Jesus Christ again. Jesus Christ. If by the time God the Father told God the Son, go and die for sinners, he said, No, I'm God, you are God. What will have happened? What will happen? If God the Father and God the Holy Spirit, if God the Father and God the Son, tell the Holy Spirit, move, go to, uh, go and do the work for of regeneration and indwelling of human beings, and the God the Holy Spirit, and God the Holy Spirit, look at his own work to come and indwell me. The Bible says our righteousness is as filthy rag, but the Spirit of God indwells you. The Bible says the eyes of God so holy that he cannot behold iniquity. They say the holiness of God opposes sin. The wrath of God cannot, cannot, cannot be anywhere near sin. Yet the Holy Spirit indwells you. If the Holy Spirit says, no, me, I'm Holy Spirit. I cannot dwell in, in this, in this uh, people who sin. Don't we sin? But the Holy, we always claim our, for our, uh, our rights. We always claim about that. And then this matter of headship, this headship in the Christian home, this headship, you see, you see, you see, that headship has a problem, and it is because of our background. We are Africans, and uh, generally, we are, gen we are generally syncretistic. That is a mixture of uh, this. The thing is, uh, you know, I am the man, and nobody can. The thing is, all that one, all that one, I always see, I always see that it's just, uh, by the time you start saying, I'm the head of this house, you have already lost the headship. You have lost it. You don't have to remind us. We know you are the leader. And you can see that work among the Trinity. The Trinity, the three of them, what is called the ontological Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, they are, they are equal, quite equal. None is before, none is after. But in the economic Trinity, as they walk, the Son will submit to the Father, and the Holy Spirit will submit to the Father and the Son, and there's no problem. God never asks us to do what he has not done more than is requiring of us. So these are the problems in the Christian family. You come and say, somebody, come and, somebody must come and... Uh, uh, be, you wronged me so you must come and apologize my answer is to, to that is while we were yet sinners Christ died for us Christ did not wait for us to repent before he died he did not wait, wait for us to promise him that we are going to repent he was not assured that we are going to in fact some people still reject him but while we were yet sinners Christ died for you then you say, you say sinless Christ committed to be sinful humanity then you an imperfect man or an imperfect woman Eh? You are not committed to another imperfect man or imperfect woman. You are saying that you want this infest. It is unchristian. And I tell you, a sign of this is that these people are not born again or the spirit of God is not in them. Whether it's a man of God. A person can be a preacher of the gospel and be a vile hypocrite at the same time. That's the truth. Right claiming of a truth. That problem creates more problems to he who claimed the right. Yes, I agree with you. I agree with you. And 
he who said, let me take everything, is always going triumphant. Yes. I look at the life of Abraham. Yes. Abraham and Lord. Yes. It was Abraham that was called. Mm -hmm. Go to a land that I will show you. It was not Lord. Mm -hmm. But Abraham willingly called on Lord a cousin. Mm -hmm. But when he reached to a certain stage, conflict come in between. Abraham could have said, Abraham had the right to say, Lord, you were not the one that was called. From here, go back to Or. If me and you will be quarreling, go back to Or. Because God called me and I called you. But Abraham says something. Lord, let us not be quarreling. Choose. We are brethren. Mm. Choose if you want to go to the south. The land is before you. If you want to go to the north, the land is before you. Lord, who? Choose the best. Choose the best. Land up in trouble upon trouble. But Abraham, taking the desert area, brings about the fulfillment of the promise God promised him. So this issue of claiming right of a truth, when we begin to look at Bible pictures, is on Christian. There is nobody, there is nobody who had told the path of God, walked in the way of Christ that ever regretted it. In any case, Romans eight twenty eight will tell us that all things work for good. So one thing we have learned today is that. Uh, we stop keeping records of wrongs everywhere. It does not help. In fact, it is a problem for you. You, the person who is keeping the records. You are the person that you are tasking yourself, both psychologically, emotionally, and spiritually. You will come out the loser. We thank you for your participation. As a matter of fact, I truly have been blessed. We thank our viewers at home. It is our prayer that from what we have discussed today, we have learned that keeping records of wrong usually, in all cases, works against the recorder. Keeping records of wrong is usurping the place of God, is placing yourself as a higher tribunal than God. Whatever you are, whomever you are, you are what you are by the grace of God. And daily, we offend God by things we do, uh, by the things we leave undone. Yet, God has never left us. He says of his church, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. Though the church has not been true to our testimony, God has not left us. The perfect Christ is committed to we imperfect people. Should we imperfect people not be committed to our brothers who are also or sisters also who are imperfect. God will help us remain blessed in Jesus' name. Amen.